Dude, we are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order. Oh, and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Bell, who is a member of the Cooperative Party and one of the leading lights of the co-op in the North East. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us, Will. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is for those who may have heard of um, the Cooperative Party, but perhaps don't know what it is. Could you explain what it is and its relationship with the Labour Party? Yeah, so, I mean, a, a, a lot of people may not have heard of the Co-op Party, uh, but equally, a lot of your listeners might have done Labour and Co-op, or they might have seen it on their ballot paper. Um, I know your audience is a bit politically um, inclined, so they may, if they're interested in local government, have heard of us through the work we do with Co-op councils. Uh, the Preston model is one that gets talked about quite a lot. Um, or if they're members of the USDOR union, or if they shop at the, the Co-op group, then they might be aware of some of the campaigns we've run with those, including um, the Not Part of the Job campaign, which was about um, tightening the laws on violence against shop workers. Um, essentially, we're, we're the party of, of co-ops. It's, uh, it's in the name. We have a unique position in British politics because we have an electoral agreement with the Labour Party. So we don't stand candidates of our own we stand on a joint ticket with Labour always, um, which is where the Labour and Cooperative on the ballot paper comes from. And we stand in all sorts of elections. We've got 26 MPs currently. Uh, we've got 1,500 councillors and we have members in the Scottish Parliament, um, in the Welsh Assembly, um, Metro Mayors, Police and Crime Commissioners, uh, you name it. Um, as, as part of... One of my roles in the in the party regionally, and as you can probably tell, that region's the northeast. I um, travel around and try and recruit people to the the party. So I mean, spend a lot of time in Labour Party meetings, but also things like fair trade coffee mornings and things like that. And usually, the best place to start is often with what is a co-op, because not everyone's always totally clear on that. And a co-op essentially is any business or service which is built by its membership and membership in this context means a, a set of direct stakeholders or stakeholders with a direct interest. So there might be employees in a worker-owned co-op. There might be the customers in a, in a business, agriculture and energy production, uh, you name it, musicians' co-ops and artists' co-ops, uh, cooperative bars. Um, and the, the co-op party is basically the political wing of that movement in the same way that you can think of Labour as being the political wing of the, the trade union movement, we're the political wing of the, the co-op movement. Um, now, of course, you mentioned uh, the links between um, the Cooperative Party and uh, the Labour Party. Um, do you think that there are any sort of inherent uh, differences between the way that the uh, Labour Party operates and the uh, Cooperative Party operates? Because, of course, some people may think that it's just an extension of the Labour Party, when, of course, that's not the case. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of people do uh, feel that way. And um, certainly, when you talk to people in Labour, people will sometimes assume it's just a, a faction of the Labour Party, which it certainly isn't. Um, we're an independent party, and we don't take any official stance on in internal Labour Party politics. We don't endorse a candidate for Labour leadership, for example. We don't put slates um, or even back slates in um, Labour's internal elections. Um, we sometimes treat like we're one of the socialist societies like the Fabians or Labour Housing Group, but, it, but we, we do have quite a different relationship. Um, so we started originally in 1917 as a response to largely at the end of World War I, um, a lot of cooperators found themselves being uh, fast tracked to the uh, to through conscription really because a lot of the people heading up the conscription boards didn't were, were factory owners and things like that and didn't really like the competition they were getting from these cooperative upstarts. So in 1917, uh, a meeting of cooperative societies formed our party. Labour had already existed for for 17 years at that point. The um, the two parties did compete for about 10 years uh, electorally, um, but realised that we had 
more in common really um, and, and formed our pact in 1927. Uh, in terms of different approaches, yeah, we we tend to think of our model as being very compatible with labours and very complementary of labours, but it's also very different. Labour has, well, labour is the party of, of nationalisation and that's fine, we support nationalisation where it needs to happen. But we don't have necessarily the same emotional attachment to nationalisation that, that Labour does. It, it seems a strange thing to talk about the two parties differently because most of our membership are, of course, Labour members as well. Um, but we value ourselves on the, or, or are guided by the concept of, of subsidiarity, which is the idea that power should always rest at the lowest possible level, decision-making power in particular. You know, if you think of in 1947, so all those signs going up in collieries, this, this colliery is now being managed by the National Coal Board on behalf of the people. Well, that's, that's all well and good, but it, it comes to a, a point where there, is, there are ways in which we don't want our economy managed on behalf of us. We want, mm. we want to manage it, you know? We want things... We, we're about democratising the economy, essentially. Um, now, uh, one of the uh, other things uh, that you mentioned is, of course, the uh, link to um, cooperative um, shops and cooperative uh, societies. Um, do you think that this, uh, in some way, allows the cooperative party to have more of a, perhaps, link to individual communities and uh, individual areas with the, the, the links with the co-op shops? Yeah, um, so co-op societies affiliate to us in the same way that unions affiliate to the Labour Party. Um, our biggest donor is the co-op group, that's the, the shop that everyone will be aware of. Um, yeah, and in those societies, like the co-op group, like of your listeners might be aware of, send delegates to our national conference, um, vote on, on some of the policies that we take. Um, in terms of links with communities, <clears throat> absolutely. One of our strengths in the co-op party is our presence in local government, particularly through initiatives with the, the co-op council's innovation network. There were all councils that are committed to the co-op model. And um, a lot of our campaigns are the sorts of things that can achieve practical results through working with, with councils and communities. So looking back at some of our previous and most recent campaigns, uh, the food justice campaign, which is specifically working with councils to tackle food poverty in, in their areas. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, re requests to that policy is that councils, for example, make a cabinet position for food justice or food poverty. Um, the, some of you listeners may be aware of our um, modern the charter, where councils whether Labour or otherwise, could sign up to this charter, which was really about making sure that their, their procurement process didn't have any um, modern-day slavery practices in it because people don't realise how, how um, omnipresent and pervasive slavery still is in, in Britain um, in, its, in its modern form. And a lot of procurement might be using sources that uh, have extremely exploitative practices in them. So this is so we're rooted in working with with councils in things that are very practical and achievable. You know, we're not just sitting around waiting for a, a general election where Labour wins so that we can start enacting our policies. Mm. And you mentioned um, uh, the cooperative uh, party conference there. Uh, what is that like? Is it at all similar to other political party conferences? How different is it to that? Yeah, it's it's over a, a single weekend, but yeah, it's, it's everything that you'd imagine um, a party conference to be. Delegates voting on on policy, keynote speakers, big politicians, people from from the co-op societies and trade unions. It, it's it's everything that you would you, you would imagine. And, and from that, we develop our policy process. So we have our own manifesto, which we put out at each general election, which is largely complementary of Labour's. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more. Um, specific in, in terms of the things that we were asking for. Um, so, and that, and that comes out of our conference uh, largely. Uh, so, for example, for the last 10 years or so, lab, most Labour manifestos have made some commitments to doubling the size of the corporate sector. Well, we, our manifesto really looks at the how typical 
co-op party manifesto policy would be things like setting up a cooperative development agency that's publicly funded. You know, there are cooperative development agencies around the country now, and they often have the support of local authorities. But uh, we'd like to see a, a national development agency for co-ops. Um, some things, some ways that could be resourced um, would be where large companies are fined for market abuse or um, anti-competitive practices. We'd like to see those fines paid to to the cooperative development agency so that they can uh, resource uh, and finance people to set up their own consumer co-op startups um, and other, other kinds of policies that we, we would look at. A lot of startup co-ops, um, or a lot of co-ops generally really, have a problem with raising outside investment because of the, the way co-ops set up. Um, the capital is usually held in a a member of a few co-ops, I can't, although I have a share in those, I can't, for example, sell my share to a third party. Mm-hmm. Uh, co-ops are typically asset locked. So if they're, if they're wound down, the assets have to be transferred to another organization, typically another co-op, which means that they can't be like um, asset stripped in the way that some other companies are. But because of that, they have trouble raising outside investment. So one thing we would want something in our manifesto in our policy platform is um, tax breaks for profits that are reinvested back in a company because that's the primary way that co-ops grow. Um, and so that policy might sound a bit uh, wonkish, a bit um, specific for a manifesto, but um, it, even more generally, that value of, of uh, subsidiarity guides all of our policies, you know, um, so not just economic devolution that convention set up to look at further powers that could be transferred from Westminster to the uh, the national parliaments. Um, even things like uh, our energy policy, you know, um, we'd, we'd like to see a, a huge increase in renewable energies like any good uh, left or centre-left party. But it's not just for us, not just because that's great for the environment, but also because things like solar and wind um, and, and renewables generally have a real potential for decentralizing energy production and that's that's the sort of thing we're all about decentralizing economic power you know um having a, a, a energy uh, generation plants that could be owned by the community that they're serving because they're small enough and manageable enough to do that um now uh, one of the things um that you mentioned there uh, was of course uh the fact that uh, cooperative societies that the stakeholders and they can't be uh, sold and asset stripped and that they are very much based um, in uh, the community now, of course what's been happening recently with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is we've seen people obviously um, restricted to their homes and uh, their communities more than ever do you think that uh, once this is resolved we will see a, a greater push towards um uh, local community shops uh, and more cooperatives as opposed to um, supermarkets that are often on the outskirts of town and removed from communities. Do you think that that's something we'll see? Do you think that's something that could potentially be desirable? Yeah, well, I think that the um, is clearly in a massive state of flux. Um, and I think that co-ops, uh, I mean, in, certainly in the very immediate term, a lot of cooperative societies are out there in the communities right now, they're helping to organise uh, volunteer organisations. They're um, helping um, organise food banks. Um, and, and you know, a lot of co-ops are extremely rooted in their communities. Some retail societies only have one shop. You know, uh, like the Allendale Community, uh, Allendale Cooperative Society. Um, so yeah, they, they, in the immediate term, that they're, they're already out there um, making sure that they're they're propping up communities that are really struggling but it's, we're all as a things co-ops aren't particularly a new idea they've been around a few centuries in their their modern form but they do represent a very dynamic break with the kind of models we've had for for a, for a long time dominating our economy you know the arguments between the market and the state privatization and nationalization um and also aspects of, of what the economy might look like post pandemic is that we could very potentially be looking at a, a very serious 
wave of austerity after this. Local government uh, is already on its knees from the last 10 years. Um, local government's now being told that promises they were um, what were being made to them aren't necessarily going to be kept in terms of government finance. And where local authorities look to do things on a budget, things like co-ops can really help in a local authority. But you don't necessarily want to bring in some big private operator um, on, a, on a local authority contract that's just out for what it can get. You can empower communities to do things themselves um, and to plug the gap of cuts themselves. So I'll give some examples. I don't know if any of your listeners um, subscribe to a, a quarterly magazine called Sturt to Action. It's a bit of a, a lefty magazine um, that, I, that I get. And um, in the recent issue, one of our co-op councillors in Lambeth, Anna Bird, about private uh, nursery, which closed down, which served the, the community and the parents in that community were left completely stranded without any childcare. So the cooperative councillors, um, like Anna, um, met with parents in the community cooperative childcare service, which is now um, certainly on, at least on the road to being up and running, I believe. Uh, another really good example, it's a couple of years old, but it's one I always come back to, is in 2014 in Whitney, uh, if you remember David Cameron's old constituency, there were cooperative councillors in Whitney and the council had to cut bus subsidies, which meant that the private operators weren't going to start servicing routes that were unprofitable. Um, so Laura Price, who was a co-op uh, councillor, sorry, a uh, cooperative councillor, which a community transport serves the community, which are deemed unprofitable. Uh, that that society, although it's uh, oh, six years old now, it um, I believe it has five buses now, maybe four or five. It's it's, it's going strong, and it's as I say, that community has been empowered to do things themselves. Uh, so, so to answer your question, um, in terms of what we're looking at after after COVID, I, I think local authorities are going to be forced to people. Uh, in that way um now uh, of course uh, one of the things that we've seen recently and uh, not directly related to the uh, the cooperative party uh, but uh, connected to it is the change in leadership in the labor party from um jeremy corbyn uh, to keir starmer i just wondered whether uh, with that change of leadership do you think that there will be a a, a change in attitudes in in relation to the the cooperative party or how do you think that changing leadership could potentially uh, impact it? Well, um, Keir is not a, a co-op-sponsored MP, so he doesn't come up as Labour and Cooperative uh, on his ballot paper, but he is a, he is a member of, of, of our party. I believe Angela Rayner is many Labour and Co-op MPs to his uh, shadow front bench, including Annalise Stodd's uh, shadow chancellor, which was absolutely brilliant for us to have um, such a capable cooperator in such a position as that. But I mean, it's worth saying that the for a long time, really, uh, most of my adult life, the Labour Party has been fairly decent um, to the Co-op Party. Um, if you look, if you go through previous manifestos, there are that there is that commitment in the last two manifestos to doubling the size of the cooperative sector. There's, uh, what you'll usually find in Labour manifestos is they'll they'll make a commitment like that, and then they'll talk about areas that where they'd like to see more co-ops like they'll say oh we need to expand credit unions or cooperative wind farms or something but they, but they don't often talk about how we get there um but we're always happy with with the promises uh, even the 2010 manifesto was really really good on co-ops if you go through it uh, i've been through it with a, a fine tooth comb and uh, yeah i mean you know in the 2010 manifesto there's even a commitment in there to um, turning the then struggling Northern Rock into a co-op. So that would have been interesting if, if Labour had won in 2010. Um, so yeah, so the Labour Party is um, generally supportive of us anyway. I hope that because of Keir Starmer's membership and because of the promotions he's made in his shadow front bench, that we'll certainly see a lot more of that. I mean, I often get from Labour members saying, well, why do we need a co-op party? We've already got a Labour Party that's committed to alternative models of ownership. And the thing is, cooperation goes in and out of fashion in the Labour Party, you know, and recently it has been 
reasonably well supported. The, the New Economics Foundation worked with the Co-op Party um, our ideas. But, you know, you, you go back through other, other eras of Labour and that wasn't always the case. So we- um, we're coming towards uh, the end of the podcast. It's been a uh, great to speak to you, uh, Michael. It'd be great to have you uh, on again some other time. And the final question uh, that I'd like to ask is, obviously, we've discussed the pandemic. Um, and, of course, that, you know, we've all been... Uh, sitting in a lot more uh, than we yeah. otherwise uh, would. Uh, what one thing are you most looking forward to being able to do that you can't do uh, when this is all over? What sort of thing would you really looking forward to being able to to do again? Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's on topic anyway, at least. But um, one thing I'm really concerned about is the idea that we won't get to have a co-op party conference this year. Um, but of course... For, you know, if safety concerns are are paramount, then that that's fair. But in my personal life, I mean, I, I work in a, a co-op. I work in a, a, a member, a customer-owned uh, pub, a social club, and uh, yeah, really missing that. Really missing my customers, uh, missing the sense of community that that my my workplace has. Well, uh, that's a great response. I think we've all been uh, somewhat missing uh, the sense of community. <laughs> Uh, you know that we've previously had, and I, I hope your customers are looking forward to uh, seeing you once again. Thank you Absolutely. once again. Thanks very much, Will.